This format is weird to me now because it's been so long since I've done one of these. Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is the first of many videos that I have had to reshoot because I lost the footage. Really the biggest differences between the last time that I filmed this and now are the location and the fact that I decided I'm putting my hair up tonight and just dealing with it. We have to talk about Captain America, the first Avenger. If at this point in time you haven't seen Captain America, the first Avenger, it's been almost 10 years and I'm kind of wondering what you've been waiting for. But just in case, it says it in the title that it is the origin story of Captain America who became the first Avenger. It's about a young kid, Steve Rogers from Brooklyn, New York, who wants to enlist in the army in 1943, but is disabled and is therefore ineligible. And all he wants to do is punch some Nazis, basically, because he thinks that it's his God-given right. It's war propaganda. We'll say that loud and clear now. We're all aware of it. Let's just say it and get it over with. In any case, a German scientist working for the American army picks Steve for an experiment to make him into quote unquote, the perfect soldier. Steve becomes a tool of 1940s anti-Nazi propaganda. Eventually, he leaves his post as propaganda Barbie doll, basically, and actually becomes a real hero, i.e. the first Avenger. Captain America the First Avenger was directed by Joe Johnston, and it was released in 2011. I have only seen a handful of Joe Johnston movies, but among them are Jurassic Park 3, and Jumanji. He also directed The Rocketeer and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and he has a background in visual effects. He worked on most of the original Star Wars trilogy and a couple Indiana Jones movies. His movies are not boring to look at. That is the least that we can say about them. And we're gonna go right into our pros and cons now. For some reason, I wrote down Spinny Laser at the beginning of the movie, which I know what I'm talking about, but like, why did I bother with that? <laughs> I wrote down that the Tesseract has been on Earth this whole time. The movie has like two opening scenes, but one of them is a scene in which the villain of the movie, Johann Schmidt, goes to Norway and is in search of the Tesseract to build big bad weapons, which he says are supposed to be for Hitler, but they're really for him. So, you know, the tying in of my favorite boy, Thor, right at the beginning. Good luck there. I wrote Tiny Steve down, which is Great. It's Chris Evans' face superimposed onto another human being's body until he, until the experiment is done. That's a pro, apparently. <laughs> there is no other way to talk about Steve Rogers than to talk about him as a disabled person. Sorry, son. Look, just give me a chance. You've been eligible on your asthma alone. I mean, the reasons that he can't enlist in the army are all because of his disabilities. The idea that Steve is then cured of those disabilities by becoming Captain America is a different conversation to have, and I think it's a worthy conversation, and I think other people have had that conversation. Steve hates bullies and jerks. He basically tells Dr. Erskine that he wants to enlist in the army because he doesn't like bullies. Do you want to kill Nazis? I don't want to kill anyone. I don't like bullies. I don't care where they're from. When I say basically, I mean like word for word. So Chris Travaganza came out of me rewatching all of the Captain America movies two years ago at this point. I just had never seen Captain America, the first Avenger all the way through up until that point. So I really have no place making fun of people that haven't seen it even still. I apologize. And simultaneously, I just did not understand the fandom's obsession with Bucky. Um, I really liked Steve because I had seen all of the other movies that Steve is in. And then I watched this movie all the way through and I got it. Bucky is a good man and a very good boy. Don't do anything stupid until I get back. How can I? I'm taking all the stupid with you. You're a punk. Jerk. Bucky really cares about his best friend who's essentially his brother and I, I totally subscribe to that. I have a lot of feelings about Bucky now. Um, like, is he my favorite character? No, I think he's shortchanged in the long run, but that's a conversation to have when we get to the Infinity Saga. So very far down the road from now, but I do really love Bucky now. And it's because I've watched this movie three times in the last two years. Dominic Cooper, Howard Stark is probably my favorite version of Howard Stark. Uh, the MCU also shortchanges Howard Stark 
in that they want me to believe that Dominic Cooper becomes, I forgot the actor's name, but the actor that plays old Howard Stark. Howard is two separate characters throughout the MCU. And I don't know if that's like poor planning on their part or just poor casting. Stanley Tucci is in this movie and literally any movie that Stanley Tucci is in is automatically better because Stanley Tucci is in it. It's the same as Emily Blunt and Anne Hathaway. Like, Stanley Tucci is just up there. You know what I mean? Does that make The Devil Wears Prada the best movie ever made? I might be onto something, but that's for another day. I also actually really like Dr. Erskine. Stanley Tucci as Dr. Erskine, but as a character, just Dr. Erskine by himself. He really has a lot of influence on the man that Steve becomes, and that influence stays throughout the MCU, even if Erskine is more or less forgotten about after the first movie. You see that kind of influence in Age of Ultron, which I'll get to eventually. I think Dr. Erskine is probably one of my favorite characters in the movie, just because of the, like, soft compassion that he has for Steve especially, but basically anybody that he comes into contact with. What's not to like about Agent Peggy Carter? She's beautiful, she's tough, she can kick your ass without messing up her lipstick. Of course, there's the flag moment where the other soldiers can't climb up the flag to get it in order to get a ride back with Agent Carter, and Steve just kind of pulls the little metal piece out and the flag falls. Because Steve is much more than just physical brawn and like always has been and always will be. Hands down, my favorite conversation, piece of dialogue, scene in the movie is when Erskine sits Steve down the night before the experiment is gonna take place and they drink and they talk and Erskine tells him, Whatever happens tomorrow, you must promise me one thing, that you will stay who you are. Not a perfect soldier, but a good man. And I think for the most part that is upheld throughout the MCU. There's the whole bit about how Steve just doesn't know how to talk to women. I guess I just don't know why you'd want to join the army if you're a beautiful dame. An agent, not a dame. You are beautiful, but... You have no idea how to talk to a woman, do you? Women aren't exactly lying enough to dance with the guy they might step on. And then he's clueless about, like, stepping on toes when... I think her name is Agent Lorraine, even though they never actually call her by that, but the woman that Natalie Dormer plays for five minutes, she, like, makes out with him, but... It kind of steps on Peggy's toes, even though Peggy doesn't really want to admit it. And then he brings up the whole fondue thing more than once. Like, to, I guess it's the 40s, so food is very different, especially for people of different social classes. So I, it doesn't really surprise me that Steve doesn't really know what fondue is, but like, the fondue thing. Fondue is just cheese and bread, my friend. Really? I didn't think- Nor should you, pal. I wrote down the emergence of Dorito Chris. I forgot the pillow. I guess the funny part of that scene is when Haley Atwell like almost touches him and then like backs away really quick. So there are two main montages in this movie and one involves the political propaganda, the military propaganda, literally. The movie is not secretive about it being propaganda. <laughs> but Steve is basically fashioned into a Hitler punching Barbie doll and because of this parade to raise money for war bonds so that you know the government can buy bullets. Comics are written and like the original Captain America comics where Captain America is punching Hitler in the face are featured in the movie. There are little moments throughout the movie where the movie kind of reminds you that Steve is an artist. It's not really touched on because it's not really what the movie is about, but it's an endearing kind of trait about Steve. At this point, I think we all know that Chris Evans did most of his own stunts. He had stunt doubles, of course, but he did most of his own stunts because he just moves in a very unique way that not many people can really replicate in a believable fashion. I think especially Joe Johnston has talked on this subject of just having Steve do the things that he can do physically instead of having the stunt double come in because the stunt double wouldn't be able to do it the same way that Steve can. That Chris can. I really had to think about what his name was there. I think my second favorite line in the movie is, You know what you're doing? Yeah. I've knocked that Adolf Hitler over 200 times. They're like, excuse me? I don't think you have, sir. Steve saves Bucky from Hydra, even though they have already started brainwashing him. And it affects Bucky the rest of the movie, at least the rest of his runtime, because of course, 
Bucky falls off a train. Their friendship is pretty important to me and I really love the moment where they're sitting in the bar immediately after Steve has recruited the Howling Commandos to go and take out the Hydra weapons bases and he asks Bucky, You ready to follow Captain America into the jaws of death? Hell no. That little guy from Brooklyn, I was too dumb not to run away from a fight. Following him. Just kind of reinstating to Steve that Captain America is just a name. It's it's a title at best. I would just like to say that Steve Rogers on a motorcycle is very hot. And the last pro that I wrote down is Peggy and her battle pants. Whew. Whew, that's a look. <laughs> We're gonna move right into cons without further hesitation. The first con is Nazis, because we don't like them. It's pretty obvious. When Bucky and Steve go to the Stark Expo, Bucky brings two girls and one of them is his date and the other one is supposed to be a date for Steve. And she completely ignores him even when he tries to like give her a little bit of popcorn. And I, in no way am I trying to imply that this girl owes him something, but he's not being a weirdo, so like, she could have at least just acknowledged that he was there and I would be totally fine, but she, she just like completely ignores his existence. It's just a weird dynamic more than anything. It's, it's not that I'm like upset that she ignored Steve necessarily. It's just a weird dynamic. Erskine's death is not like super hard to deal with or anything. It's just, I like him and I'm sad that he's dead. I wrote down that they won't let Steve fight because he's the only super soldier. The serum worked. I asked for an army and all I got was you. You are not enough. But I think there's also the idea that like, once he comes out of the machine, he is essentially the ideal image of an American man. So that's why he becomes a propaganda tool. And like Steve himself is not really interested in any of that. He's just doing what he's told until he doesn't. I guess I'm gonna have this conversation now. So I don't have any problems with Steve and Peggy. I actually really like Steve and Peggy as a duo and I think that if they had gotten the chance, they would have been something great. They had a lot in common, they had similar morals and ideals and I think that would lend itself to a really compelling and interesting couple. Especially because we get to see how Peggy really admires who Steve is as a person before the experiment and those feelings don't stop for her after the experiment. However, I think the whole kiss with Lorraine is kind of useless because like why do we really need Peggy to be jealous of anything? Steve is already inept at talking to women and I think that's enough on its own. I also on the other side think that the kiss is whatever. Doesn't take too much away from the movie, but I also don't think it's entirely necessary. But getting back to the wider conversation of Steve and Peggy, by the end of the movie, I don't really buy that they are so in love that he would obsess over her the way that he does in the future, especially after Winter Soldier. But I think if I remember, I will get to that conversation um, because that's not what this movie is about. Do I think that they have a strong emotional connection? Absolutely. Do I think that missing out on that opportunity can be really devastating? Yes, but I don't think that it would be devastating for the rest of Steve's life, you know? Of course we lose Bucky and that's a con because it's sad. And it happens so fast. Like one second Bucky is there and the next he is blasted out of that train and then he's just falling. They wanted it to hurt and it does every time. I wrote Schmidt needs to get the word Valkyrie out of his filthy Nazi mouth. Born to victory on the wings of the Valkyrie. <laughs> just gotta laugh at that for a second. Overall, I think there are a few weird editing choices and a couple weird lines of dialogue, but it's not a badly edited or badly written movie by any means. There are just a certain things that, that come up that you're like, why did you do that? Like two montages and I still cannot figure out which one is less necessary because I really wouldn't suggest more than one montage in your movie, but there's like the propaganda montage that shows how quickly Steve realizes that he is just a tool for propaganda and not actually doing what he wanted to enlist to do, what Dr. Erskine wanted him to be able to do. And then there's the montage of uh, going in and eliminating all of the Hydra weapons bases, which essentially only serves to show the Howling Commando as a team, I think, um, but 
but we never hear them called the Howling Commandos until the Winter Soldier. Maybe that's the one that's not necessary? Between the two of them? Because if you don't show the propaganda montage, then you miss out on a part of Steve's kind of character journey, but you also definitely miss out on the context for I've knocked out Adolf Hitler over 200 times line. Whereas with the battle montage, you don't really miss too much. I have some logistical questions about the end of the movie. Peggy asked Steve to like turn the ship around instead of drowning it, and he says, This thing's moving too fast and it's heading for New York. Right now I'm in the middle of nowhere. If I wait any longer, a lot of people are gonna die. So he could just turn it around and then it would go back into the middle of nowhere. Or why couldn't he just jump ship with the Tesseract? Or without the Tesseract, why couldn't he just jump ship as it was heading towards the water? I mean, he's a super soldier. Any regular human, yeah, probably would die doing that, but he's literally a super soldier. He is built to be able to withstand action like that. So why couldn't he just jump out of the ship? I mean, overall, it's better for the MCU timeline that he didn't, but like, I feel like there was a better way to deal with the ship and the Tesseract after he got rid of Johann Schmidt. Well, Johann Schmidt got rid of himself pretty much, but Steve, I don't think drowning the ship was your only option, buddy. Those are it. Those are all my cons that I think are worth talking about. The good thing about having already watched this and filmed before is that I don't need my computer for this video because I can just pull up the Excel spreadsheet with all of my information already in it. Captain America, the first Avengers, IMDb score is 6.9. The Rotten Tomato score is a seven. My score was a seven, and I watched this alone both times now, so my score is the only one that you're getting. And the total score for Captain America, the first Avenger is 20.9 out of a possible 40. So not bad, but also not great. That's kind of how I feel about this movie. It's not bad, but it's also not my favorite Captain America movie. I think it's longer than it needs to be. And again, one of those montages have got to go. I don't think both of them need to exist. My arbitrary rank for this was the main character's fashion sense. And I mean, Steve is dressing in 1943, so it's pretty bland, <laughs> but it's fine, I guess. Steve is not concerned with what he looks like, and that's understandable. The next movie for Crush Travaganza is What's Your Number? That is one that I watched with other people, so we'll see how that works out. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please click the bell below so you don't miss any of our future videos. And if you're not already subscribed to The Princess and the Scrivener, please do so down below as well, especially if you'd like to see more videos on Disney, intersectional feminism, pop culture critiques, Chris Travaganza, and more. And also for algorithm reasons, give this video a thumbs up, especially if you really, really enjoyed it. I hope my notes get better as I go along in these videos because spinny laser? One of us will see you real soon.